Over the last several months on this show, we've talked a great deal about housing prices and whether or not the unprecedented price appreciation of the past few years is sustainable. And as a reminder, there are a few things that have sent property prices skyrocketing. To name a few, there are low interest rates, strong demographics, and low inventory. Today, I'm going to talk about another trend in the housing market that began long before the pandemic and is likely to remain one of the biggest drivers of the housing market for decades to come, and that is the housing shortage. For years, the U.S. has not been building enough homes to keep up with demand, and today we're going to, to dive into this trend, unpack the current housing shortage, and of course, we'll talk about what this means for the housing market going forward. What's going on, everyone? My name is Dave Meyer. I am the vice president of data and analytics at Bigger Pockets and a longtime real estate investor. And each week, I take a look at the economic and financial information that you need to be an informed investor. If you like content like this, please make sure to subscribe to the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel and turn those notifications on so you can stay up to date on everything going on in the world of investing. That said, let's jump into this week's topic, which of course is the housing shortage. Put in the simplest terms possible, there just are not enough homes in the United States to keep up with demand. According to Freddie Mac, the deficit was approximately 3.8 million single family homes as of April, 2021. A shortage of this scale has big implications for real estate investors and for the U.S. economy as a whole, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, let's look at how we even got to this point. The housing shortage has gotten worse during the last year or so, but this problem started decades ago and has become most acute since the Great Recession. Take a look at this graph that shows the number of new housing units being built in the United States. As you can see in the graph below, home building absolutely tanked during the Great Recession to the lowest levels on record, just below 500,000 per year. It has recovered significantly since then, but it took a great deal of time. Only in the last year or so has construction returned to the levels that we saw back in the 80s and in the 90s. To put this in perspective, from the years 1959 to 2006, the average number of units under construction in the United States was 1.55 million per year. Since then, the average is just over 1 million per year, a drop of almost a third. Even with the recent uptick in construction, even as the population of the United States has been increasing, the number of homes has being built has actually decreased. And of course, like all things economics, there are many factors that have led to an underbuilding problem, but these are a few of the biggest reasons. First is a lack of demand around the Great Recession. The housing market, it was just in shambles back then, and it was not very enticing for builders to put up new construction when there was already a glut of inventory on the market at discounted prices, so builders, they just didn't want to build. It wasn't profitable for them. The second reason is that even when demand started to pick back up, it was difficult for construction to scale accordingly. Unfortunately, many construction and home building businesses went out of business during the recession, and even the ones that survived have had trouble finding labor. According to a recent survey by the Associated General Contractors of America, 81% of construction firms said that labor constraints are a major issue for their business. The third reason is land use regulations and zoning restrictions. Of course, this varies pretty significantly from market to market, but a lot of cities and municipalities have been slow to update their building laws to adapt to a growing population and increased demand. The last issue I'll mention is surging prices on raw materials. And this is a more recent development, but it should be mentioned here because it could inhibit recovery from this housing shortage. Of course, the 500% increase in lumber prices we saw earlier this year is one extreme example and it has since come back down to earth a little bit, but inflation and supply chain issues could continue to make building more expensive. So for these reasons and more, the U.S. has fallen short of the needed housing supply for almost 15 years. And even though housing starts are increasing, the problem appears to have gotten worse over the last several years. The same Freddie Mac analysis that produced the 3.8 million housing unit shortage that I mentioned at the top of the show estimated the shortage to be just 2.5 million units back in 2018, meaning the size of the deficit has grown by more than 50% in just two years. How could this be? Why would the problem be getting worse 
when construction is increasing? The answer is demographics. The millennial population is about 72 million people, the largest demographic group in the United States. This group is also hitting the peak home buying age right now, meaning a huge group of Americans is trying to get into the housing market right now, sending demand up and intensifying the housing availability problem. See, the housing shortage isn't just based on how many houses there are. It's also based on how many people want to get into those houses. The way the deficit is calculated is by analyzing the number of single family homes needed to meet the demand of household formation, second home purchases, and replacement for any homes that need to be torn down and rebuilt. And then they compare that to how many new housing units are being built. And with millennials getting to the age where people traditionally start families and desire home ownership, demand is surging after a 15 year lag in supply. Now, the fact that demand for homes is being generated by first time home buyers makes the housing shortage problem particularly bad because this, that subsection, the entry level part of the market, has been impacted the most by the construction shortage. Just take a look at these two graphs from Freddie Mac. And by the way, there is a link to this full report from Freddie Mac in the description below if you want to check that out. And the first graph here shows that even as housing starts have grown in recent years, less than 10% of new homes being built are considered entry level. And that is down from a peak of 35 to 40% in the early 80s. So back then, 30, 40 years ago, we had 35 to 40% of all homes being built were considered entry level. Now, it is less than 10%. So when you look at the second graph, you can see the result of this disproportionate decrease in terms of total building volume. The number of new homes built under 1,400 square feet, which is how Freddie defines an entry-level home, has not recovered from the Great Recession, not even close. In 2020, Freddie Mac estimated that there were only 65,000 new entry-level homes completed, which is less than one-fifth of the average amount construction during the 70s and 80s. If you're frustrated at trying to get into the housing market with an entry level investment property or an entry level home, you are not alone. A massive group of Americans are looking to get into their first home at a time when entry level home building is close to non-existent. This makes for a massively competitive market, particularly at the lower end of the price spectrum. This dynamic creates an economic challenge for many millennials as they are boxed out of the wealth building opportunities that come with home ownership. It also makes it harder for a younger generation of real estate investors to enter the market as older and institutional investors have a better position to buy into this high priced market. So the question is, how long will this shortage last? Well, to keep up with current demand growth, it is estimated that home builders will need to build 1.1 to 1.2 million single family homes per year. But that is just to keep up with current demand growth, not to shrink the deficit. We need more building to chip away at the deficit than just 1.1 to 1.2 million. And luckily, in June, the annual rate of home building hit about 1.6 million, significantly over the 1.2 million needed to meet current demand growth. So let's just do some quick math here. If we need 1.2 million units per year to meet current demand growth, and we're building about 1.6 million per year right now, that means we're chipping away about 400,000 units per year. Since Freddie estimated 3.8 million units short, it would take nine and a half years to eliminate the deficit at the current pace of building. Of course, the rate of building could increase or it could also decrease too, but from the data we have right now, it doesn't look like the housing market, the housing shortage is going away anytime soon. So what does this mean for the housing market? To me, it means that there are long-term tailwinds for property prices. It's simply supply and demand. There are too few homes on the market during a time when the largest generation of Americans is reaching peak home buying age. This is a perfect scenario for sustained price increases. Of course, there are many other factors that will play into the housing market over the next several years, interest rates, foreclosure moratoriums, and inflation, just to name a few. And those factors and any number of other microeconomic drivers could impact the price of housing in either direction in the short term. But beneath all of those other drivers is perhaps the strongest driver of all, supply, pushing housing prices upwards. So while it might seem like the housing market is in a bubble and prices are unsustainable, remember that there are very sound economic reasons why housing prices are going up right now. 
To be clear, prices could flatten or even decrease due to any number of reasons that I mentioned above for a period of time. But for as long as a housing shortage exists in the U.S., which according to our napkin math could be about 10 years, I believe the U.S. housing market will continue to trend upward. This, of course, will help any property owners build equity and wealth over time and could be a big boon to existing real estate investors with an active portfolio. But on the flip side, it will make it harder for new home buyers to or new investors to enter the market or for existing investors to grow their portfolio, especially if wage growth does not keep pace with property price appreciation, which it has not not even come close to in the last several years. So for this reason and more, I believe that the long-term prospects of rental property investing remain very strong, even during this wild and unpredictable period of rapid appreciation. As I noted in my video from two weeks ago, the short-term housing market is a bit unclear right now, but the long-term outlook remains overwhelmingly positive, at least in my view. That's it for me today. Thank you all for watching. If you want to be learn more about becoming a real estate investor, or maybe you're already an investor and want help growing your portfolio, head over to biggerpockets.com where you can join the largest community of real estate investors in the world completely for free. There's a link below so you can check that out. I am Dave Meyer and I'll see you all next week.